Hello. <laughs> Uh, thanks. Hello and welcome. Um, so yeah, we're going to try and do a deep dive into the performance side of, of using Elasticsearch for um, logs and metrics here. Um, so this is my colleague Rafao. I'm Radu. Um, we are search uh, consultants and software engineers at Sematext. We have a bunch of stuff. Just to introduce you a bit of in, on, on our background, um, on the consulting side, we do consulting, obviously. Um, performance, uh, sorry, production support and uh, trainings on uh, on top of Elasticsearch and Solar. And we also help uh, on the engineering side uh, work on our um, two main products. One is called Logzine. Um, it's a log uh, aggregating service uh, backed by Elasticsearch, exposing the Elasticsearch API. Um, and a SPM is for metrics. You can use it to monitor Elasticsearch and a bunch of other stuff. So this talk is kind of be based on our experience with running Logzine and SPM and also on our work with clients doing similar things sometimes. Um, so what we're going to go through is start with a higher level of how you would um, divide your data uh, into indices, how you would uh, uh, design your cluster, and uh, then we're going to uh, go into the specifics of how you would tune each Elasticsearch node to perform uh, better. Uh, a bit of um, operating system options and also some some of the um, how you choose your hardware. Um, and we're going to finish by talking a bit about the pipeline of um, uh, ingesting um, data into Elasticsearch and how you can optimize that. So first of all, uh, of course, you can just take Elasticsearch out of the box, not care about anything, get one uh, large index and start indexing your data. But apparently, uh, things won't work well in such a setup. Uh, that's, beca that's because there are a few things around Elasticsearch we'll talk about today uh, that m are bottlenecks uh, inside. And to overcome some of the bottlenecks there, uh, we first start with daily indices. Most of the tools, shippers, and log processing tools in general supports that. So the idea is to have a new index every day to hold your uh, data. The, the time-based data, of course. So metrics, logs, anything that is time-based, we can do it like this. So the idea around that is to start indexing uh, and allow Elasticsearch to create an index uh, for the current day and just push the data there. Why it works better? Because in general, those uh, indices will be smaller compared to one large index. You can imagine that you have hundreds of daily indices, for example, uh, 365 for one year's worth of data. And if you divide them into 365 pieces, then uh, choosing a smaller piece will be more performant. Uh, indexing is faster in that way because we uh, avoid uh, mergers uh, expensive mergers, and we'll talk about that a bit later. In, ad in addition to that, if you would run with a la one large index to uh, allow yourself to delete data, you would have to delete it by using a query. That's not efficient at all. And here with daily indices, we can just uh, drop the whole index, which is just a file system delete without any uh, internals uh, of Elasticsearch needed to be updated or anything like that. Uh, in addition to that, when we search on the data, we can say, OK, let's search for the one week worth of data, so which means seven indices. That's, again, way more performant than searching through all these 365 days. Finally, those indices that are not uh, updated, because we only index in the newest, uh, the current daily index, because usually when it comes to metrics and logs, you don't update your data, then we can cache some of the information and use portion of the memory to actually retrieve those cache, uh, cached uh, information. So uh, this brings us to uh, a more efficient storage, basically. However, the problem with that approach is that uh, for some kind of data, like logs, not metrics, uh, there can be problems with which we like to refer as Black Friday problem. The, the problem here is that, for example, if you log not only your uh, metrics or uh, how your application performs, but also what your users do, and for example, you run an e-commerce site, then on the Black Friday, you'll get way more traffic than in the other days. And that causes your indices not to be balanced properly, which Elasticsearch uh, doesn't like very much. 
So uh, when running daily indices, then you have one big index in that Black Friday, and then lots of smaller indices during the next days, which is, again, nothing that we would like to go for. Uh, in addition to that, there is a certain point when we index uh, our data to indices in Elasticsearch where performance drops. Uh, that's because uh, that's typically between 5 and 10 gigabytes, at least from our tests and from running our own environment, because we consume our own stuff uh, and we do play with that uh, every day. Uh, we, for our hardware, we run into that problem around five, per five gigabytes or 10 gigabytes per shard when indexing throughput drops drastically, as you can see on that graph. So how to avoid that kind of problems? In general, those problems, to be avoided, we need to first measure that and know what they are all about. So uh, the performance drops is because of the so-called merges. And what are the merges? For those of you who don't know Elasticsearch and how it works internally, uh, it uses the Lucene library. And the Lucene library, when you index data and flash it to this, creates a so-called immutable segment. Those data structures contain a lot of data that is needed for search, and those data structures can be updated. So once you have uh, the, e the segment flashed to the disk, it stays there. You can only update it slightly, like adding information on which documents were deleted, but not deleting them physically uh, from the disk. Then. Uh, the more segments you have, the slower your searches are. So uh, when you flash the data, apparently we don't have unlimited memory, so we have to flash uh, the data from memory and create new segments. The searches, the general full text searches, will slow down because of how Lucene is structured. It contains uh, those term dictionaries that needs to be traversed through and needs to, to find the data and match the documents we are interested in. So the idea is to somehow limit the expensiveness of the merges. And what the merges are, okay, it's basically copying a portion of the segments from uh, Lucene Index, so from Elasticsearch Index, uh, which is the same basically here, and uh, merging them together in the one larger segment. Uh, and we can avoid that by running so-called size-based indices. So the idea, uh, this is a step forward from the daily indices. Instead of rolling the index every day, we roll that at a certain size. For example, you remember that uh, information that around 5 to 10 gigabytes of a shard size, we uh, encountered the problem of, of the drastically dropping down the throughput of indexing. And this is where rotating the index by size really helps. Because if we know that at the 5 gigabytes per shard, uh, we start uh, to lose throughput, then we can roll, roll over the index when that particular moment uh, comes closer. So if we have like 10 shards, we know that the, when the index is close to five, 50 gigabytes, we just roll over and create a new index. Uh, the, it's a less flexible solution, uh, mostly because of uh, the data uh, being uh, from multiple days ending in the same index. However, we gain a lot of performance uh, going from that, so the flexibility cost is uh, nothing compared to what we can gain from hardware uh, perspective and from per performance perspective. Uh, how to work with it in Elasticsearch? It's very simple. With Elasticsearch 5.0, the new, the new version that was released, we can just use the rollover index API and say, OK, at this given point in time with that amount of data in the index, just roll over our, our alias and uh, uh, and start a new index, and we do, do not actually care what's there uh, because the right index, uh, right alias will be updated, and we will, do, and our lock shippers will just run uh, using the same alias, and we can still index the data like no, nothing happened. Uh, in the earlier versions of Elasticsearch, like 2.4, 2.3, we just need to update the alias and run some kind of script, or for example, curator to make that uh, rollover happening. Again, nothing very complicated, not a rocket science, just a simple uh, UI, uh, sorry, API call to Elasticsearch to allow that. Uh, just to summarize that a bit, um, the uh, size-based indices are not only good for uh, 
for what we said for general purposes, it also flattens the, down the spikes that we used to ha we have in our log and uh, log environment usually because it doesn't really affect metrics. If you monitor your CPU usage and you don't spin up ten. Uh, thousands of containers at the same time, you won't see a spike in the metrics, right? And of course, you need to make sure to rotate the logs bef bef before the performance drop happen uh, in, uh, that we've mentioned. Uh, however, that's not all when it comes to Elasticsearch and how it should be handled. You know that Elasticsearch comes as a single software package, and if you run it, you already get a distributed environment, right? But we can divide Elasticsearch, and we really should divide Elasticsearch into certain roles. There are at least four of them right now. So first of all, the client nodes, the ones that are handling uh, our general queries that spread the queries through the data nodes, gathers the results, and sends the response back to the client. We should have a few of them so the data nodes do not have to care about uh, merging the responses. Then the data node is the layer, the workhorse of your cluster, basically the one that will hold the data and run the uh, smaller queries inside the data that it has uh, on the hardware that is running. Then we have the masters, the brains of your cluster uh, that uh, manages the cluster, manages the mappings, hold the information about the cluster layout. We'll talk about why this is important in just a second. Finally, something new for Elasticsearch 5.0, ingest nodes, basically a log stash inside your Elasticsearch cluster. You can run uh, analysis, you can uh, modify your events on the fly once they in are on your Elasticsearch site. So again, something nice, but comes with the, again, with performance uh, issues, but rather we'll talk about it uh, a bit. So uh, what we can do here is we can optimize the data layer. How to do that? Uh, one of the common approaches with logs and in general with time-based data is the co hot cold uh, architecture or hot warm cold, but we'll uh, talk about the simplest example, which will be the hot and cold. So the idea here is to have a certain part of your uh, data uh, piece of Elasticsearch, the data nodes, uh, assigned as a hot nodes, the ones that will handle the, all the indexing and the new real-time searching. Uh, and in addition to that, the second part of your cluster is the cold tier, the one that is mostly about the archiving of the data. Uh, and the idea is to have uh, the data that you need to be searchable as fast as it can, so in near real-time manner, uh, on the hot side, while the other, the longer running searches, for example, on the cold node. How it's done? Again, we index only, we create the indices on the hot, uh, hot tier. And when it's time to move, for example, let's assume that we want only a single day worth of data on the hot nodes. Then we can use the allocation uh, awareness of Elasticsearch and just say, OK, for today's data, we, we say that we want to move it from the hot, so exclude tag hot and include tag cold, which means, OK, Elasticsearch, move it to the cold tier. Without any service interruption, Elasticsearch will just move the data there, and things will look uh, as you can see on the picture. Still, indexing will be done on the hot tier to the new indices. Once a few days uh, pass, we'll see something like that. So we'll have more and more indices on the cold tier, and only the hot indices, the ones for near real-time uh, searching and for indexing on the hot uh, tier. Things to remember, for hot tier, you need a good, good CPU and best possible I.O. that you can get. So SSDs are your friend, or if not SSDs, go for RAID 0. Uh, for uh, cold tier, you will need HIP, because Lucene and Elasticsearch, because of that, needs a static amount of memory uh, depending on how much data you have uh, to be able to s uh, have the indices open for searching. And in addition to that, Elasticsearch talked to itself internally, so we'll need some kind of uh, I.O. for the stats to be able to run in a timely manner, uh, so not to actually delay uh, the calls so that your Elasticsearch cluster doesn't fall, uh, fall apart. Uh, then uh, I, the things that we like about hot cold uh, architecture is that we can optimize our costs. So we can put better hardware on hot uh, tier and slightly uh, worse hardware on the cold tier, uh, lowering the cost of the whole operations. In addition to that, performance is also we also gain performance because of that. And finally, we isolate the long running searches from the hot tier, so we do not uh, interfere with the indexing itself 
on the cold, on the hot tier. However, I would like still to uh, stay a bit uh, about Elasticsearch and say a few more uh, a few more words. So first of all, the dedicated masters is a must. I've mentioned that I mentioned masters, and if you do not want to run into issues of having multiple clusters instead of one uh, during the network splits and uh, having your data corrupted. Uh, have at least three master nodes there for you. Uh, of course, only a single one will be the elected master at the given point in time, but you need at least uh, three to be able to have a fault-tolerant uh, solution. And you need to set the discoveries and minimum master nodes to 50% plus one of your master eligible nodes. So in our case, when we have three master eligible nodes, it would be set to two. If we would have five, that would be set to three, and so on. The next thing is to remember to keep your indices balanced. That's why we actually uh, say to go for the size-based indices, to be able to spread the indices around the cluster uh, easily and to allow actually Elasticsearch to do that very well. If you will won't do that, then you will run into hotspots on your cluster. Some data nodes won't be, will be loaded more than the others and that can cause cluster instability. Finally, Balance primaries are also good. Primaries are used for backups. Primaries are used for moving to call data to call tier and so on. So again, if you will have all your primary shards on a single node, that will be mean that this node will be more uh, exhausted when it comes to CPU and I/O than the other ones. And again, cluster instability can happen, and the cluster may just fall down and crash, and all things bad may happen in general. When running in AWS, spread your data across availability zones. That's very simple with the allocation awareness. For example, say uh, during Elasticsearch start, just set this, uh, set the node attribute zone to, uh, for example, to zone A, zone B, zone C, and then uh, say that I would like the zone attribute to be used, and Elasticsearch will spread the data as it should. Uh, also, as we all uh, mention every time, leave some headroom for Elasticsearch. It likes some headroom to be there for spiky uh, behavior. For example, if uh, something bad happens in your environment, not in Elasticsearch side, but somewhere else, you'll get lots of lots of exception. For example, Java one, and that will mean a spike in uh, uh, indexing, and we want that to be handled without crashes on Elasticsearch side. Finally, if you uh, have lots of shards and lots uh, large machines. Think about garbage collection. That's again another performance uh, bottleneck that can be. Uh, so if you are running lots of lots, of, if you have lots of data, uh, think about tuning down the garbage collector. Uh, maybe go for G1 GC if you are above, if you need to go above 30 gigabytes of memory, or create smaller instances with less data and run with smaller heap, which is usually a good idea to go for. Uh, a bit more about Elasticsearch. Uh, <laughs> so there are a few things we can tune around that, uh, around that particular piece of the environment when it comes to metrics and logs. So Elasticsearch allows us to uh, tune, for example, merges, which we say that it's one of the most uh, crucial bottlenecks uh, of indexing. Then we have the refreshes, so how uh, fast we see the data, and the flashes, so how often we write the data to disk. Usually the flashes are the ones that we leave alone and do not touch at all because the defaults are, are very uh, reasonable. However, when it comes to merges, as I've mentioned, uh, the merges, uh, the segments, whenever you have more of them, the searches are slower, the full text search ones searches. However, when it comes to log analysis and metrics, it's more of about aggregations, and they are not really uh, bothered by too many segments. That's why we can lose up, um, uh, loosen up the merge policy and just say, OK, I'm allowed to do a bit more segments and increase my throughput because I, l uh, I merge less because I have more segments. So what we can do, we can increase the index merge policy segments per tier to have more segments and less merging, so more throughput of indexing. We can increase m the max merge at once. Uh, again, uh, less th um, more segments merge at once, so we will spike the, uh, the merging uh, process. And finally, reduce the maxed merge segment, which means that uh, Elasticsearch will put more focus on the smaller segments, which will be easier to merge instead of merging the ones that are 
uh, up to five gigabytes by, by default. And last thing from me, uh, a few, uh, last few things from me, refresh interval by default one second, so uh, once you send the document, there is uh, one second uh, between it's being available for searching. If you go for five seconds, you get 25% more throughput, 70, uh, three sec 30 seconds, 75 per percent increase uh, of throughput. You can increase the memory buffer for higher uh, indexing, lower down the, qu uh, the queries uh, cache for high velocity data, omit norms, not store, uh, fields if source is enabled because you don't need it, and finally, do not store the all field. And I'll let Radu talk a bit. A bit more about Elasticsearch. <laughs> um, so one thing that you can do is not to store stuff that you don't need. So if you have fields uh, on which you only run aggregations, so you never actually search on them, you can skip indexing them. Um, and the other way around, if you don't run aggregations on some fields, you can say doc, set doc values to false and not store doc values. Um, doc values being the col columnar store um, of Elasticsearch that's used for sorting and aggregations. Um, and doc values, if you store them, can also be used for retrieving data. Um, so you can um, use that in order to not need to have everything in the source field as stored, though source is used also for uh, updates and highlighting and a bunch of other things. But if you don't need those, then you can use doc values uh, for retrieving data too, so then you can um, save some space there. For metrics in general, you probably don't have a full text search field, so all the fields are kind of um, either indexed or aggregate. Um, and then you can disable source altogether and, and save some space. If you have uh, source enabled, then um, you can uh, try and compress it more. Um, so th there's the setting index codec best compression, uh, but if you do that upfront, uh, then all the indexing will slow down. So what you can do is to do it in, in older indices. You can uh, set, uh, set that there and then uh, force merge segments into smaller, uh, into sorry, into fewer, bigger segments, um, and then that's when the uh, best compression will apply. And you can do that on cold nodes if uh, you have a long retention, so that this investment of CPU and I/O kind of pays off. I want to do a bit of detour on metrics, uh, and you have a bunch of ways you can lay out your data. Um, so one thing you can do is all the metrics that you can spit in one uh, call to Elasticsearch, you can put uh, each, let's say, class of metrics in its own index. Um, and that will work well uh, as long as you don't have uh, very many indices. And then you'll probably need to consolidate them. Um, and when you do that, you can do that with one uh, more sparse index, except Lucene currently doesn't deal with sparse data very well. Um, it will hopefully improve um, in the near future, but right now you all those merges will be more expensive if you have a sparse index like that. Um, you can work around that by having one document per metric, but then you're going to duplicate a lot of the metadata, such as timestamp, host name, and whatever else you, you collect. Um, one way around that is to use nested documents, which means still you'll have one document per metric, um, except you'll have this parent document which can hold the, meta, the metadata for a, for a bunch of them but then you're going to pay with more heap usage on the Elasticsearch side because it needs to, heap, to keep some data in memory to do those joins of, of those sub-documents. I want to move, it, move a bit uh, to the operating system. Swapping is a big no-no um, for the JVM. Um, then the disk scheduler, so uh, by default in Linux you have completely fair queue which kind of serializes writes uh, and that works well for uh, spinning this, but if you have SSDs, you probably want deadline or no op instead. Uh, and if you want to gain a bit more IOPS, you can skip writing the uh, access times. You can also make the journal uh, not synchronize uh, uh, those writes. Um, and finally, I want to move on to the hardware uh, part. As Rafael mentioned, on the hot tier, you'll need more CPU. You'll need a lot of CPU for indexing and those expensive merges. You'll need a lot of I/O throughput because you're going to need to write a lot of data and also read them from read again for merges. Uh, on the cold tier, you'll need more memory because you're going to store more data. Um, and then 
on the I.O. side, latency becomes more important because of those uh, stats calls that you mentioned. Um, Elasticsearch is also sensitive to network latency, so you, really you need really good networks um, uh, between the nodes. You don't want to spread your cluster up to multiple data centers. Um, and this is uh, even more important when it comes to storage. So if you have network-based storage, it really needs to have a very low latency. Network throughput is important when you move shards around. So when you move like from hot to cold or when you're doing any replication or backups. So to give you some examples, we can tell you what we, we're using or what we've used. Um, we had, uh, on, on AWS, we had the C3 instances, which are compute intensive. Um, we had those first, and then we figured that the local SSDs they had, we could we needed more disk than they provided. So then we need to attach EBS, and we could use the local SSDs as a cache. Um, and then later on, we moved to the C4 instances with EBS only. Now we're a bit more um, I.O. bound, but we get close to the same performance with, with less cost. For the cold tier, I2 instances are very good. They have lots of RAM, big local SSDs. The problem is they're kind of expensive. We try to work around that by using D2 instances, which have spinning, uh, bigger spinning disks, uh, but we got bit by this I.O. latency factor, so we couldn't actually use all that big disk. Um, so we settled for the M4s, which are kind of like C4s, but with more memory, and then selected kind of the EBS size we wanted. Um, and when I say EBS, I mean the general purpose SSD EBS. There are multiple kinds. Um, um, you can also have provisioned IOPS EBS, which is very expensive for, for these kind of use cases. Uh, and spinning disks uh, tend to be too slow. Um, and for uh, these GP2 um, EBS, you get more performance, I mean, more IOPS, more transfer, the, the bigger um, your volume is, um, up to certain thresholds. So in general, you need, you need to make sure that you're under, let's say, three terabytes to get the best out of your data. And the thing is, performance isn't guaranteed, so you can... Um, you can try to make use of this burst of, of IOPS that you can get up to one terabyte by putting multiple smaller ones into RAID 0, but then if one gets slower, then your whole RAID will be slower, so we're actually avoiding that now. Uh, instances need to be EBS optimized in order to get one, uh, to get a separate network card for, um, for EBS, so that's really good. Um, and also enhanced networking um, makes latency more consistent, again, working at the driver level. So the final part is talking about the pipeline, um, and the cen cen sorry, <laughs> central piece in the pipeline would be the buffer. So you really need to, to have some buffer somewhere in your pipeline that enables, uh, enables you to batch messages and send them uh, in batches to Elasticsearch and also like if Elasticsearch slows down or uh, becomes unavailable so you can you can have some buffer. Um, and, and buffering is really, I think, the number one reason why you would want to have a dedicated log shipper and not try to ship directly to Elasticsearch from your application. Uh, because buffering comes with its own challenges, which I will talk about right now. Um, starting from where you should log initially and then what kind of processing you want to do um, and then finally, if you want to deliver maybe to some other destinations, not only to Elasticsearch. Um, so a small detour, um, if you're logging to a file, that can also act as a buffer. So like Tudor said earlier. But when I say buffer, buffer, I typically mean a buffer of a log shipper or some dedicated software like Kafka or Redis. Um, one thing uh, related to buffers is um, where you do the processing. So uh, in, in a typical scenario like this where you have a indexer that can be log stash or file bit or anything else that pushes to a central buffer, let's say Kafka, then you would probably want to have a uh, indexer log stash instance that pulls data from Kafka, does whatever processing it needs, and then pushes data to Elasticsearch. And that works really well unless you want, sorry, to add multiple destinations, um, then 
those destinations need to be in sync. So if Elasticsearch uh, becomes slower, then the other destination will also have to have the same pace because it kind of blocks the whole pipeline. So one way to go around that is to have different consumers, each having its own offset in Kafka, so then you can process things independently. The consumer can be Logstash or something that you write. But there are other options too. So for example, if you use SyslogNG or FluNG, uh, you have this on the shipper side. That most of the processing happens on the input, and then for each output you have its own buffer, so um, data can be processed asynchronously. Our syslog Sorry, so um, the problem here is if the input side processing becomes too expensive and becomes a bottleneck, then you're going to back off to the uh, to the hop uh, before that, so you're going to put uh, pressure. Um, our syslog solves this problem by having an extra buffer on the input side, so most of the processing happens after some buffering. Um, and when I, say, when I say processing, it can be a lot of things. It can be enhancing your... Uh, your data with some GOIP, uh, but mostly it's about um, you need you really need to do some parsing because, uh, for example, if you log in JSON, you need to parse that JSON. If you log unstructured data, you'll need to to do some parsing there too. Um, ideally, it should be JSON. That's going to be the fastest and most convenient. But if you need to do some parsing of unstructured data, then you have two options, uh, two big classes of options. So you can do regex-based parsing, like Logstash's Grok, or you can do grammar-based parsing. Um, regex is going to be more flexible, um, but it's typically slower, uh, especially as you add more rules, even though different shippers, uh, different shippers have different uh, ways to try to improve um, the scalability um, with the number of rules. So I'm, I mentioned putting back pressure when the buffer is full. Uh, eventually, there might be a situation where all the buffers are full. So then it's important, I think, to see, to see what happens. And, and this is where it depends on where you're logging. So for example, if you log, log into a file, what happens if that file eventually gets deleted away? Does the application crash? Does it just stop logging? Things like that. Uh, if you're logging to TCP or to um, Unix sockets, those calls tend to be blocking if the destination isn't available. So again, it's worth checking if the application itself just stops working altogether. Uh, with UDP, you don't have these problems, but you can have a problem where you have a spiky load and then the, desti the destination cannot uh, absorb all of that. And there you can, um, you can tune the operating system buffers to, to have more leeway there. Um, so in terms of protocols, UDP is, is pretty straightforward. Um, with TCP, you get uh, reliability, but it's only at the wire level. So uh, the application gets an acknowledgement once the operating system buffer got the data, so you might actually lose that data if you have a power failure or something like that. If you want uh, more reliability, you need a protocol that does acknowledgements at the application level, so something like HTTP or BEATS or others. So I'm trying to, to sum it up now. Um, one decision is to do at the application side where uh, you, you should log. And I would argue that if logging isn't critical, it should happen uh, via UDP. And it can be UDP to a local log shipper if you want. But the point is the application doesn't have to bother with the pipeline. If something goes wrong there, it can continue to work. If logging is critical, then you have to pay with something. Either you pay with I.O. and you write to a local uh, file, or you, uh, you can pay with memory and have some, um, some local shipper that, that buffer thing, buffers things in memory. So some patterns that emerge from all of this, uh, one is you can have Logstash uh, on every server uh, to do all the processing and, and everything that you need and push, push data to Elasticsearch though Logstash tends to be kind of uh, big. <laughs> um, so what you can do instead is you can use FileBit um, and you can delegate processing to Elasticsearch with those new ingest nodes. And we actually benchmark, benchmark these and you'll get more performance overall if you can get the same sort of apples for apples. Other options are 
other log shippers. Uh, many of them have their own buffering, either on disk or in memory. Um, and that works well um, until you want to have multiple destinations, at which point the whole graph there becomes pretty complicated. Um, and that's where some central buffer might make sense, because you can add however many consumers you want, uh, for example, with Kafka here. Though this makes things more complex, and actually reality tends to be more complex, as in you'll have to um, mix those patterns, like let's say you have a uh, separate data center where you need to collect data uh, from some embedded devices that can only write syslog and things like that, but the patterns are kind of the same. So basically that's all for us today. Uh, if you want to get in touch, those are the contact information for us, and if you would like to work with that stuff that we've mentioned, uh, we are always looking for crazy people like we are to join uh, Sematex ranks. Uh, so once again, thank you for joining the talk. If you have any questions, uh, we still have three minutes, 50 seconds uh, for questions. So, and we will be happy to answer any, almost uh, any of them oh, now. I see one question. Here goes. Hi. Um, I've heard a lot of recommendations for the, data, for the data node and ingest node and client node, but nothing about master. A very good question. Uh, usually uh, the masters, uh, depending on the, de uh, it depends on uh, mostly on the memory, uh, because most of the queue on the master side is a single threaded. So you do not gain much with uh, more and more CPUs. Of course, more than one is nice because of the GC. This is Java, actually. So a few, uh, a few cores dedicated to garbage collection. However, memory will be uh, the bottleneck uh, mostly, especially when you have complicated mappings and lots of data, because the master will keep track of all the mappings and uh, all the indices inside memory. So if you have complicated mappings, go for larger memory. Usually, we start low. <coughs> like four gigabytes of memory, uh, and uh, we observe and, mon uh, and monitor the uh, usage. When we see a pattern where it starts to stack up on GC, uh, we see that it c just can't keep up. We need to scale and increase the memory. Uh, adding more nodes really doesn't help because only a single node works as a master node there. So more memory, usually not, the m no s n not much CPU, and disk is not uh, an issue at all because it doesn't keep any data. Thank you. So basically, the bigger the cluster state, the more juice you need on the master. Hey, so um, I'm trying to set up uh, monitoring for Elastic uh, Search cluster with Prometheus, but unfortunately, there's no really good export. And what are the uh, key metrics you would look at for performance? Because you earlier showed the performance drop off. What are the good metrics to have a look at to start with? So, so that was our product, SPM, which we used to monitor Elastic Search. Uh, in terms of the actual metrics, you can uh, you can monitor the number of so Elasticsearch has really good stats. If you just go in and hit uh, the stats endpoint or cluster stats or node stats, you'll see things like how much time it spent indexing, how much time it spent refreshing, how much time it spent uh, uh, flushing, and then you can you can you can take that information and store it somewhere. That's what we do in all of all of our all, all of the monitoring products do. So in general, CPU, memory, garbage collection, JVM pools, those are the standard things you would like to have. Also the caches, circuit breakers. Again, this is the thing you are interested in. Uh, number of shards, number of uh, number of indices, uh, the state of their of them. If your cluster, how your uh, how the number of nodes behaves. So generally, everything that's uh, exposed by Elasticsearch uh, APIs when it comes to metrics and statistics, this is a good thing to take into consideration because when uh, dealing with uh, issues. The more information you have, the least problems you'll have on diagnosing the problem. And you actually can't fix what you can't measure. 
So uh, the more information you have, the better. And in general, Elasticsearch has like 90% of all the things that, that it's needed, uh, apart from some system-related uh, things that can be retrieved from the operating system itself. OK, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.